Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We are going to start endocrinology module and we are going to discuss important endocrine problems in children. We are going to talk about today's short stretcher. Over the next 30 minutes or so, we are going to see how to define short stretcher. We are also going to learn what are the different types of short stretcher, what are the etiological reasons leading to short stretcher, and how to go about evaluating a child with short stretcher. We are not going to touch the management aspect because that requires a separate session. What is short stature? So, as the name says, anybody whose height is subnormal can be labeled as short stature. But how much subnormal height would be labeled as short stature and in relation to what? So, a subnormal height relative to the heights of children of the same age, gender, ethnic background or the family heights is considered short stature. Technically speaking, if a child's height is less than 3rd percentile or 3 standard deviation below the mean for the reference age would be labeled as short stature. Now this is important that this is in the context of the reference population. For example, reference population of North America would be different from the reference population of say Far East Asia. Hence their centiles and the standard deviation would vary. Another way to define short stature is in the context of the familial height or the parental height. So if a child's height is more than two standard deviation below the mid parental height this is called short stature. Mid parental height is also called target height and we are going to see what mid parental height means. Now these three definitions take into account height at one point in time. However, if we follow height over a period of certain months or years, we get to know what we call the height velocity or the growth velocity. So if the height velocity is less than 25th percentile on the velocity curve over a period of 6 to 12 months this is also labeled as short stature. So a subnormal height in the context of age, gender, ethnic background or the family height a height less than 3rd percentile of 2 standard deviation for the reference population or a height more than 2 standard deviation below the mid parental height or a growth. Short stature is basically divided into two main groups. Children who are short but are growing at an appropriate rate meaning by that their height velocity or the growth velocity is appropriate and those who are not only short but their growth velocity is also less than the optimal meaning by that they are growing slowly these are the two major categories as far as children who are short with the normal growth velocity this type of short stature is also called physiological short stretcher and these include entities like 
constitutional delay in growth and familial short stature and short stature secondary to intrauterine growth restriction one we have talked about few lectures back the children who are short but their rate of growth is also less than optimal are labeled to be suffering from pathological short stature and this can be because of various reasons malnutrition so rampant in our setup chronic diseases malabsorption syndromes genetic syndromes and mind you genetic syndromes is different from genetic short stature genetic short stature is when a child is short because the family is short here we are talking about a constellation of signs and symptoms that are grouped together to fall into a genetic syndrome like down syndrome a large number of endocrine problems can lead to short stature inborn errors of metabolism rickets mucopolysaccharidosis constitutional diseases of the bone last but not the least the psychosocial deprivation aspect so commonly ignored and neglected in our setup as far as chronic illness is concerned short stature can result because of chronic kidney disease other chronic kidney disease problems like renal tubular acidosis cardiovascular diseases like congenital heart defects or congenital myopathies cardiomyopathies leading to con congestive cardiac failure respiratory problems like severe asthma cystic fibrosis and chronic lung disease and you would remember from our talk on prematurity that in pre premature babies or ex premature babies they tend to develop chronic lung disease because of what we call highland membrane disease or surfactant deficiency this can lead to short stature malabsorption syndromes like celiac disease here you can see the villus atrophy or inflammatory bowel disease like crohn disease endocrine problems are very peculiar in leading to short stature hypothyroidism being one of the commonest endocrine problems that we come across in children diabetes mellitus cushing syndrome which in children is largely iatrogenic because of the use of steroids congenital adrenal hyperplasia not so uncommon in our setup growth hormone deficiency itself or pen hypopituitarism may be secondary to empty cell syndrome or septo optic dysplasia a large number of bone diseases leading to short stature and these would be what would call disproportionate short stature achondroplasia with rhizomelic shortening skeletal and spinal dysplasias like metaphyseal dysplasias examples include jensen and schmidt osteogenesis imperfecta severe rickets especially if it is hypophosphatemic rickets can also lead to short stature we have talked about genetic syndromes down syndrome turner syndrome and then there are so many other syndromes that can lead to short stature we have talked about malnutrition may be marasmus or kosher core and psychosocial deprivation not only the child abuse but the neglect in itself can lead to psychosocial deprivation and short stature how do we go about assessing a child with short stature as with many other disorders this careful history which is very very important which would be helpful in differentiating between the various types of short stature a targeted detailed clinical examination including the anthropometric measurements 
and specific laboratory investigations would be needed for the appropriate assessment of short stature. As far as history is concerned, it is important to ask about the height of the parents and the siblings as it is important to ask about the timing of growth spurt in the parents and sibling and the onset of menarche. All of these actually would be helpful in differentiating between constitutional short stature and other causes of short stature. We have talked about the importance of nutrition and the psychosocial history. One need to try to identify the predisposing conditions, looking for congenital infections, intrauterine growth retardation, syndromes, chronic illnesses that we have touched upon in the malnutrition. Clinical examination is important, but the most important aspect in the clinical examination vis-a-vis -vis short stature is the measurements, especially measuring the height. Only if you measure the height appropriately, only then one would be able to say that the height is subnormal or the height is more than two standard deviation below the average. So the measurement of height is very, very important. In younger children, we do the lying length or in the supine position. And in grown up children above the two years, it's the standing height that we take into account. The other measurements includes weight, occipital frontal circumference, arm span, upper segment to lower segment ratio that we are going to talk about in more detail. And then we need to plot these measurements on the growth charts, the centile charts. This is very, very important. And this is how the growth chart look like. We have age over here in, at the x-axis and weight in the bottom graphs in kilograms and here height in centimeters. So we plot the weight and the height according to the chronological age of the child. And here on the centile charts, you can see that the middle line, the red line over here is the 50th centile or the median of the population and then as you go up you get the 75th, the 90th, 98th and 99th centile and as you go down the 25th, the 10th and the 2nd centile. Similarly for the weight. So not only that you need to plot the height and weight on the growth chart but you also need to calculate and chart what we call the mid parental height which would give you the target height of that child vis-a-vis -vis the familial norms of that particular family. The other things that would be important in clinical examination other than the anthropometry and nutrition is looking for the other signs like visual feed defects, fundoscopy, looking for the signs of syndromes, presence or absence of a goiter, and evaluation of the pubertal stage by tenor staging. One also need to carefully look at the genitalia in the context of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. As regards mid parental height is concerned, this is the average of the mother's and the father's height. And this gives us the target height for all the children of that particular couple. There are two ways of calculating mid-parental height. The standard way where we use the growth charts and we take average of mother and father's height. For boys what we do is we add 13 to mother's height and we then take their average and this gives us mid-parental height in centimeters. And for girls Again, we take average of mother and father's height, but here we minus 13 from father's height before taking the average to get the mid parental height for the girls. This is another way 
of calculating mid parental centile as far as the interpretation of mid parental height is concerned as has been said that this is the average centile for all children of this couple this gives us their target height so most of the children of this couple would lie their height would lie within two centile places of the mid parental height for example if the mid parental height is 160 cm most of the children would lie either one centile above 160 cm or one centile below 160 cm you may want to denote it as 75th centile and 25th centile on a normal growth chart remember that only one person of the children would have a stature beyond three centile places but also it is important to realize that the child might be growing abnormally but may still be within the mid parental range the other thing in the clinical examination or the measurements is to measure the child's height velocity and this we keep on measuring from one year through pre adolescence generally speaking from one year onward the height velocity would be 5 cm per year we need to rule out on examination any possibilities of thyroid hormone deficiency or growth hormone deficiency and all those children who have significantly delayed bone age and are growing less than 4 to 5 cm per year you need to look for the possibility of hypothyroidism or growth hormone deficiency even if there are no clinical feature to suggest either of them so you calculate height velocity over a period of 3 months to 6 months to 1 year and then you plot it on the centile chart like this this is the height velocity chart and you can appreciate the age on the x axis and the height velocity over here and you can see that 5 years onward generally speaking the height the minimum height velocity would be 5 cm per year how do you investigate these children the supportive test if there is evidence of anemia may point towards celiac disease or ibd a normal cystic normochromic anemia might point towards chronic diseases or chronic renal failure thalassemia actually would have microcytic hypochromic anemia esr would be raised in chronic diseases lfts and rfts you want to see if there is any derangement suggesting chronic liver disease or chronic kidney disease electrolytes would be abnormal in certain conditions for example in renal tubular acidosis where there might be hyponatremia or hyperkalemia and these children can have short stature as one of the manifestations urine analysis again looking for protein urea or hematuria or red cells and cast etc the most important investigation in the context of short stature would be an x ray to calculate the bone age of the child now the bone age is the degree of maturation degree of skeletal maturation of the child remember that the bones change in size as well as in shape from fetal life through childhood and puberty to attain final dimensions as in young adult these changes can be documented radiologically and hence the skeletal maturation of any child can be assessed just by looking at the x rays of the hand and limbs and to compare them with the standard for that age there are different methods which are used to compare the radiological features with the standard one of the standard atlas is called grulich and pile method 
This is an example of how the bones of the hand and wrist evolve over time from newborn to four years and adolescent. So the patient's films, they are compared with the standard of the same gender and the nearest age. And then it is compared with the adjacent standard, both older and younger, to give us what we call the bone age. And bone age has got very important bearing in assessment of the short stature. So if a child is short, you go on to take detailed history, do a targeted examination and document short stature by measuring the dimension. You calculate the mid-parental height or the target height. If the target height is within the normal range, you don't do anything. You just observe the child and you just observe the growth velocity of this that child. If the target height, the height is not within the target range of the mid-parental height, again, you watch the growth velocity closely and you assess if the growth velocity is normal, that is about 5 centimeters or more per year, or the growth velocity is low. If the growth velocity is normal, the conditions associated with short stature includes constitutional delay, low birth weight or IUGR, familial short stature, and an entity called idiopathic short stature. If, however, the height is not within the mid-parental height ranges and the growth velocity is also low. The causes would include severe malnutrition, chronic diseases, endocrinopathies, genetic syndromes, chromosomal abnormalities and also sometimes psychosocial deprivation. Now to bring the importance of bone age in the assessment of short stature, one of the most important things that bone age would be helpful is to differentiate between familial and constitutional short stature. However, it would be helpful in differentiating many other causes of short stature. For example, if the chronological age and the bone age are at the same place, then we assess the growth velocity of the child. Chronological age, by the way, is the actual age of the child and bone age is the one you assess on the radi radiograph of the hand and the wrist. So if the chronological age and the bone age are at same place, you assess the growth velocity and if the growth velocity is normal, then the reason of short stature is familial short stature. If, however, with comparable chronological and bone age, the growth velocity is slow, then the chances are that this short stature is because of malnutrition or chromosomal disorders. In conditions where the bone age is less than the actual age, but the growth velocity is within the normal range, the reason include constitutional delay of growth. If however the growth velocity is also low, the reasons include malnutrition, chronic diseases, endocrinopathies. Now the last entity which I want to just highlight here is if the bone age is advanced compared to the actual age. Here, they would not be short stature. The condition would be if there would be abnormal growth velocity, perhaps accelerated growth velocity, and the condition would include the precocious puberty. The other investigation, depending upon your clinical suspicion, include the hormonal assays, T4TSH, to look for growth hormone deficiency, you do insulin like growth factor 1 or you might want to do growth hormone stimulation test or you want to do serum cortisol for Cushing syndrome or you might want to do dexamethasone expression test. 
karyotyping would be very important in conditions where you think that it is associated with syndrome. One would also look for malabsorptive syndromes like celiac disease by doing transglutaminase antibodies and the jejunal biopsy. If there are skeletal abnormalities like rickets or hypoparathyroidism or dysplasias, you would do the bone chemistry and x-ray of the now, the other concept that I want to discuss over here is very, very important. And this is the concept of proportionate and disproportionate short stature. Now, body's stature in a normal person can be divided into two segments, the upper segment and the lower segment. The upper segment denotes the length of trunk and this is from the vertex to the pubic symphysis and the lower segment is from the pubic symphysis to the plantar surface of the feet. The lower segment is actually the measure of the limbs and the upper segment actually is the measure of the trunk and the upper segment is measured by taking what we call the sitting height. Now the short stature can be proportionate or disproportionate. Remember that the upper segment and the lower segment ratio changes with age. For example, at the time of birth, the upper segment to lower segment ratio is 1.7 and this upper segment to lower segment ratio decreases by 0.1 each year to reach 1 upper segment lower segment ratio of 1 by the age of 7 to 10 years and in adults it is around 0.9 to 0.95 now if the upper segment to lower segment proportion is according to the age of the patient and the child is short as far as height is concerned this is called proportionate short stature but if either the upper segment or the lower segment is disproportionate to what the normal for that age would be this is called disproportionate short stature so here you can see the proportionate short stature Disproportionate short stature can be either because the limbs are short, meaning by the lower segment is short, or it can be short trunk disproportionate short stature where upper segment would be short. And this is how the upper segment lower segment ratio changes with age. Now, if a child is short stature and is dysmorphic, you will look for the syndromes. But if the child is not dysmorphic, then you would assess the upper segment and the lower segment ratio. Either it is proportionate for that age or disproportionate as we have said. If the upper segment lower segment ratio gives a proportionate short stature, the causes include constitutional delay in height, familial short stature, short stature because of IUGR, malnutrition, malabsorption, chronic diseases, endocrinopathies like growth hormone deficiency, hypogonadism and hypothyroidism. If it is disproportionate short stature, it is because generally because of the problem with the bones and the skeleton, osteogenesis imperfecta, achondroplasia, rickets and metabolic storage disorders all gives disproportionate short stature so just by measuring the height and the upper segment lower segment one can figure out that this short stature if it is disproportionate is because of this set of causes now just to show you how would these different types of short stature look like on the growth ch chart and the uh, if we follow the growth chart and the growth velocity. So here this is a representation of constitutional 
delay of growth here you can see that to begin with the height of the child was within the normal range then around the age of 3 4 years it starts faltering below the lower centile and it however continues following the curve and at puberty this is the time of puberty there is a sudden growth spurt and the target height is equal to the mid parental height or the familial height compared to this the familial short stature might be normal again to begin with they tend to start faltering earlier on they tend to follow the centile curves but they would always remain below the centiles to achieve their target height so remember their target height would be less than the target height of others because here the mother and the father's height would be low leading to the familial short stature but this is how the curve would look like and it would not change even with the onset of the puberty with the primary nutritional deficiency or chronic diseases the faltering would start at the time of the onset of this insult made by chronic disease or the nutritional deficiency and would keep on falling below the the lowest centile and would remain like that but the important thing over here to notice is that the weight would also be very very low compared to the weight faltering in other categories in congenital growth hormone deficiency you can see that the height is low and it keeps on falling and faltering till the intervention as growth hormone therapy started and then they pick up and they achieve the right height over the period of next months to years in turner syndrome if they are not given the hormonal therapy they would follow their own trend or their own curve and we have specific charts for the height and weight of turner syndrome and the down syndrome now the familial and constitution short stature being the commonest causes of short stature with that we come across it is important for us to understand their differences constitution short stature is more common in boys the family history of short stature would be present in the familial short stature but there would be history of delayed puberty in constitution short stature of course the stature of parents would be short in familial but in constitution that they would be normal as far as the parental height is concerned the bone age is very very important as we have discussed earlier as well in familial short stature the bone age and the chronological age would be at the same place whereas the bone age would be markedly decreased than the chronological age in constitution short stature in familial short stature they would remain short but normal for their target height however in constitution short stature they would ultimately achieve the height they would no more remain short and this would happen at the time of the pubertal spurt so the take home message from today's discussion is that all short stretches are not pathological for example the commonest being the familial and the constitution short stretcher or physiological short stretcher where you don't have to do much except to follow them and to monitor them closely we have also understood the evaluation of growth velocity and we also are aware of the various causes of the short stretcher we know that the detailed history targeted examination and accurate measurements are very important and we know how to plot on the growth charts and how to follow the growth velocity we have understood the concept of mid parental height and the target height and we know the importance of bone age and other investigations many important personalities were not really very tall they were not even of the average height thank you very much if there are any comments or questions